Uh, a number of years ago, I uh, had the chance to go to uh, a mission trip that took me to Pakistan. We had our, our missionaries that were there at the time uh, doing a discipleship training school, and I went and taught for about a, a week or so in the school, and this was at the end of being gone for about a, a month or so, and I was, uh, it was great because we actually I had uh, people in the church praying 24 hours. You remember that time? People were, they, I didn't even ask anybody. They just, you're going where? And, you know, okay, we're going to, we did a sign up. People were praying around the clock, 24 hours a day for, for the, almost a month that I, that I was gone. Still not sure who was praying when I was in that little car accident in Singapore, though I never tracked that down with the time difference. But other than that, I was really concerned about this leg of the journey because I would leave those guys in, in Lahore, in Pakistan, and um, and I used to have to explain where all this was. Now we, we know we know we see these maps on the news every night. So I left Lahore and I had to fly to uh, Karachi, where um, a Westerner had just been kidnapped a couple of months before that and held for uh, for ransom and so forth. So uh, I was uh, really uh, wanted a lot of prayer about that portion of the journey, and uh, and the Lord orchestrated the events and moved the schedule around because. Uh, uh, flight got canceled that gave me, uh, instead of standing in the, in, uh, outside the airport for four or five hours holding my suitcases so that they would not be stolen, uh, uh, and waiting for the airport to open in the morning, it got delayed enough that I could actually have time to go to a hotel, spend the night, and, uh, and then return in the morning. And uh, just to kind of frame that a little bit, I'm talking about locking the door, checking the windows, and shoving the dresser against the door, sleeping with my passport and my wallet underneath my pillow, kind of resting for, you know, four or five uh, hours. It's, uh, it's a little different being in a Muslim country uh, when you're a big, tall, howly guy. And uh, <laughs> I don't exactly blend in. And uh, anyway, I, uh, I made my way back to the airport and and after going uh, through uh, uh, at least six times being frisked and being searched before getting on the plane, which was the normal uh, thing uh, back in those days, and I'm sure it continues today. today. Uh, and then once you're on uh, Pakistani Airlines, something else happens that's a little interesting. Before you take off, you get your normal safety kind of uh, uh, dialogue that goes on. And then, uh, and then you, you, um, you get to hear the, uh, the reading from the Quran for the day from the Prophet. You know, so that, that goes on for a little while. And once that's done, you, you take off. And the plane was about, uh, I was beat, and I'd been traveling for a while, and uh, the plane was about half empty. So I'd asked the flight attendant if I could grab the, the exit uh, uh, aisle so I could have the extra uh, leg room and all that. And they accommodated me, and I, that's where I was s- seated. Now, what I was doing is I was, uh, once we got, when I was reading a book, I was about halfway through. I'm going to quote from it in a minute come out in the late 90s by um, Hal Lindsey, and it was called The Road to Holocaust. It was about Israel's right to exist. Very interesting reading on Pakistani airlines, me and all the other Muslim guys that are on the plane. And, um, and so here I am, I'm reading, and then one of these guys comes by, nice fellow, and says, uh, excuse me, uh, do you mind if I kneel right here? It's my time of prayer. And, and evidently, I got the only space where my legs are that's big enough for somebody to undo their prayer shawl, uh, you know, rug, and, and get down and pray. And my side of the plane apparently was facing Mecca. So here I am, literally, I got a, <laughs> this Muslim guy praying at my feet, literally, and I'm reading my Hal Lindsey book. I'm kind of trying to cover <laughs> the cover of Israel's right to exist. I wonder if he can read English, Road to Holocaust. I probably should have put a cover, you know, on the, on the thing. And I'm reading along, and he gets done, and it's like very, very appreciative and, and everything. Very nice gentleman. He gets up, and at that point, I look, and there's a line. <laughs> I got the only spot, you know? So it was either move or ch- charge them all a buck, you know, one of the... And I went for the move. I thought it would be the prudent thing to do uh, to, to move along to another seat and let these guys uh, uh, have at it there. And this is one of the things that I was reading in, uh, in, in that book in regards to the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, Hal Lindsey writes, from the 12th chapter of Genesis onward, the rest of the Bible message is related to four unconditional covenants which God made with Abraham and his descendants through Isaac and Jacob. Not only Israel's destiny, but indeed the destiny of the whole world is secured by these covenants. Without an understanding of these covenants, 
it is impossible to know what the Bible is really about. And, uh, and I would uh, just say, obviously I agree with that statement or I wouldn't quote it. If you don't really understand the Abrahamic covenant and what it's all about uh, and uh, its details and so forth, we're going to miss a lot of what the rest of the Bible is about. And the church predominantly has for about 2,000 years, by the way. There, there's, a, there's about 85% of the church out there of, of what we, people would call themselves Christians. We might uh, disagree with uh, over some things, but of those people from Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox and the Eastern, Eastern Church, all the Reformed churches, uh, all the Presbyterian, Lutheran churches, those guys are all Reformed. Uh, they would all disagree with that statement, and they would have a different view of this covenant misunderstand it and misunderstand then certainly everything that has to do with Bible prophecy uh, and what's going to take place in, in the future. I think it affects other areas of their theology as well, and, and, and we'll look at some of those very, very briefly. Uh, but again, the New Testament has a lot to say about it. Much of Paul's uh, arguments when he's in the book of Romans trying to explain our salvation and when it's by grace and grace alone, who's his number one example? Abraham. His faith was accredited to him as righteousness. It's all about God's grace and God's promises to uh, Abraham. We'll look at that a little more as we go along as well. But let's read. We're in Genesis 12. The first uh, three verses say, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And here's, here's the promises. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you uh, and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, uh, again, um, uh, let's just, I'll just, I've got about seven points that we'll go through, and I wasn't sure if I'd make it, but I did in the first service. So, I'm, I'm fairly confident that if I keep rolling along, we'll, uh, we'll be all right. But the first thing we want to look at is the definition of a covenant. What is a covenant? And uh, so you don't have to take my word for it. This is from Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary. A covenant in the biblical sense implies much more than a contract or simple agreement. A contract always has an end date, while a covenant is a permanent arrangement. Another, another difference is that a contract generally involves only one part of, the, of a person, such as a skill, while a covenant covers a person's total being. We enter into contracts all the time, whether it's a loan, whether we're going to contract somebody to build something or, or work on our car or whatever it might be. That's not the same thing as a covenant. We about the only time the, these days that we use the word covenant is when we're talking about a wedding. We're, when I'm performing a marriage, right before I do the ring valves, I'll say, are you ready to enter the covenant of marriage? Different than a contract. Because as the that definition, if you went to any Bible dictionary, it's going to give you basically the same kind of wording to say it has to do with the fact that it is a permanent agreement and that it's a commitment of the total person, as, as in the case of marriage. And I think we kind of all, all get that. So in the Abrahamic covenant, these promises, it's a permanent commitment of the total person. And as we'll say in this case, it's the person of God uh, committing himself to uh, the person of Abraham. Uh, secondly, there's two kinds of covenant that God's enter, God enters into. Covenants, uh, again, are things that are sometimes temporary as well as sometimes things that are eternal. There's five major covenants in the Bible. Let's name them now. No. But uh, uh, again, one is unconditional, the Mosaic Covenant. We'll talk about that as an example. The other four uh, are not. They're, they are not conditional. And uh, certainly we won't go through all of them, but again, just to, uh, for the sake of laying out some groundwork, let me read a, again a definition from Dwight Pentecost. He says, a divine covenant, a sovereign disposition of God whereby he establishes an unconditional or declarative compact with man, obligating himself in grace by the uh, untrammeled formula, I will, to bring to pass of himself des definite blessings for the covenanted ones, or a proposal of God wherein he promises in a conditional or mutual compact with man by the contingent formula, if ye will, to grant special blessings to man, provided he fulfills 
perfectly certain conditions and to execute definite punishment in the case of his failure. Two kinds of covenants. Uh, the definition applies to both, but one is conditional, one is not conditional. And the classic conditional one is the Mosaic Covenant. God says to the people of Israel, as you go into the land, I'm going to have a relationship, a covenant with you that says, if you do this and this and keep my word, I will bless you in the land. And if you don't, <laughs> then you're going to get yanked out of the land. And, and I'm going to deal with you uh, in a very specific way. So here's my blessing, but it's conditioned on your obedience and your response. I can, and that's uh, uh, really detailed in a wonderful parenting manual called Deuteronomy 28. I don't know if you ever teach your children about Deuteronomy 28, but I always did. I always reminded them when we were going to the dentist, for example. We're on our way to the dentist. I would tell Josh, I would tell Melissa, especially that first trip, and they've never been to the dentist before. They're a little apprehensive. I would tell them, when you go in, if you're, if you're good and you obey the dentist and you open your mouth and say, ah, when he asks you, if you don't cry and you don't wiggle and you don't fuss too much, then you'll be blessed. We're going to go get frozen yogurt. You can have any topping you want. It will be a blessed day for you. But on the other hand, if you squirm and you fuss and you won't open your mouth, then curses for you. We're going to have some little punishment when we get home. So this day can be a great blessing or it can be a great cursing. Deuteronomy 28, Mosaic Covenant. That's what God says. Great little parenting tool, a little tip for you, uh, you parents that are, that, that are out there. But again, the distinction between the two, because the covenant with Abraham is not conditional. It is unconditional. And, uh, and we'll look at that now. So there's a definition of a covenant, the description of the unconditional covenant. And uh, as I mentioned, there are four unconditional covenants that must seen as, as literal. We won't time, take the time to go through, uh, through all of them. Obviously, God established a covenant with Noah, with David, and so forth. And, uh, and they are never seen as something mystical or hidden. Here's my promise to you that is permanent. I'm committing my whole self to you, God says, but it's kind of mystical. It's not really literal. You have to kind of figure out what it means. Now, there's a lot of people in the church that hold that position. And what I'm going to say is if you look at these things and they're plain and simple reading, they're always seen as just literal. God says, I'm doing this. And here's the promise. Uh, and you can take it to the bank and trust me uh, on this. In second place... These unconditional covenants are eternal. So they're unconditional and they're eternal. And again, just so we can see it clearly in Scripture, and so you've got the references for it. We begin in Genesis 17, 7. There God says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Let me just keep stating the obvious because I'm telling you there are millions of Christians around the world that don't believe what I just read, read to you. Uh, Genesis 17, 13. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money will be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Later down in verse 19, then God said, No, Sarah, your wife sh shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And we could go uh, on and on. Not only is it unconditional and it's everlasting or eternal, it's made with a covenant people. Now, again, uh, in the New Testament, Paul never makes a distinction to say somehow, as some of the teachers would, that somehow the church has replaced Israel. He always makes a distinction between the Jews and the church, between Israel and between the church. Romans 9, 4 says uh, of the idea of they being the covenant people, who are Israelites, to her, whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according the, uh, to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. And then he goes on Ephesians 2, 
uh, in, uh, in verses 11 and 12, and states just the opposite, that everybody else, the Gentiles come into this relationship with God, are not of these things and don't have uh, the covenant. So again, I'm trying to go over this. It seems pretty straightforward to me. I, I, a little background on this. I just, as a young Christian, I, I would be studying the Bible, learning all this, and I could never understand. It just seemed weird to me. And I was just talking to one of the guys between services. Is it seemed to me if there were this many Gentiles and this many of them were believers in Jesus as Messiah, then there were this many Jews in the world. There should be the same proportion, I would think, or close to it, that were believers in Messiah as well. But it was not. How come? It's because something went very, very wrong uh, in church history. And it all has to do with a basic, simple uh, understanding of, uh, of what I'm, I'm telling you right now. A very simple definition of a covenant. There's a description of the unconditional covenant. Let's look at uh, some of the doctrines impacted by the covenant. And I'm just going to mention a few because we could go on and on. But it certainly impacts the doctrine of salvation because God's entire program for salvation is all based on the Abrahamic covenant. One of those universal truths is that Abraham, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Wow, all the nations through Abraham? How could that happen? Well, the Messiah would come through David, his descendant, and then from David to, to Jesus, and he would die for the sins of the whole world. So all the world would, uh, would be blessed. It's all predicated, again, on the, the covenant with Abraham. Would God keep his words or not? And, of course, when Paul's laying out, again, his position of salvation in Romans and Galatians, his primary example of being saved by grace through faith is, is, uh, is Abraham. Secondly, it impacts the doctrine of resurrection. Jesus, when he's debating with the, uh, with the Sadducees in Luke 20, recorded, of course, in Matthew, also uh, begins to talk about the Abrahamic covenant. Oh, just uh, uh, keep in mind the fact that the Sadducees did not believe in miracles or angels or the resurrection. That's why they are sad you see, as opposed to the Pharisees. So these are the sad you sees that he is debating with. And he says this in Luke 20, 37. But even Moses showed in the burning bush, bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. And basically he's saying that, uh, that God made a promise to them, to Abraham. He is, he's not the God of the dead, but he's of the living. Did they see the promise? No. Abraham died. Isaac died. Jacob died. They all died. None of them saw the Messiah. None of them saw the promise to Abraham fulfilled where all the world would be blessed by them. How is the only way that they can see that come to pass? The only way is if God raises them from the dead so that they can see the Abrahamic covenant fulfilled. So even Jesus, when he's making a case for resurrection against the guys that don't believe in it, goes back to the Abrahamic covenant. Paul does similar when he's making his case in, in Acts chapter 6. So again, Paul, whether he's chained to a Roman prisoner or a Roman, Roman uh, soldier or as a prisoner or if he's preaching to the emperor Nero or he is before Agrippa, always trying to share the gospel. And Agrippa, Paul knows, is very familiar with Judaism, their customs, their teachings, and so forth. And so he tries to make an appeal to that, Acts 26, 6. He says, now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain for this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Agrippa, I know that you know these things. And here I am. What am I, what am I being held prisoner today? Because I preach Jesus Christ who rose from the dead. And I preach it because it was promised to our fathers. And ultimately, again, that promise goes back to, uh, to Abraham. So again, we could go on, but, but the doctrine of resurrection, the doctrine of salvation, but uh, mainly uh, what we want to talk more about is this idea of the doctrine of the church. Uh, and this is where the, the church has really really uh, been misled and, and gone astray uh, because there are promises in the nation of Israel. This is what I'm going to do. 
uh, all the kings of the earth will, will come, uh, you know, all nations will, will be gathered, uh, Israel will be preserved, they'll be regathered, they'll be converted, all these things uh, are promised in the Abrahamic covenant, uh, and yet they, they have not uh, happened yet. That means they have to happen first. It, Israel has to be drawn back to the land, and in the land they have to, again, cry out to the Messiah, and the Messiah comes and he establishes his, uh, his kingdom and so, and so forth. But, uh, but again, if the church replaces Israel, then God's word is not going to come true. If if these promises and these covenants are for the church, because this is the, what we call replacement theology, this is the teaching of, uh, of most of these other churches that I've mentioned, then God's word can't be trusted and it's not true because he said these things would happen. And what I want to tell you is that it's going to happen. Israel has been brought back in the land. They are going to cry out to the Messiah. And that's what's going to bring Jesus Christ back to planet Earth. And that's what we, why we can trust uh, God's word, is that despite the circumstances we see around us, we still can take his word literally, and we can believe it despite what's, uh, what's going on. And, uh, and basically, in, in church history, because of uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church, as it was organized after there was no longer persecution, adopted this position of replacement theology. They held that position. The Eastern Church broke off from them. They held that position. The, <laughs> the Russian Church is established. They held that position. The Church makes its way up into Europe. You have the Reformers, Martin Luther uh, and, uh, and, and others, and they were good Catholics. And what they wanted to see is a Reformation takes place within the Catholic Church. And they said that we believe in the errancy of Scripture, the priesthood of every believer, and salvation by grace alone. Everything else is good. <laughs> We're good with everything else, including this particular view. It gets held in by the Puritans that come to this country that want religious independence, not be told uh, what church they have to attend by, by a government state and godly men. Uh, and they, uh, they come over here, they still hold to the same position. Uh, the reason the church kind of came to its senses, thank God for those liberals. The liberals started bashing the Bible. The liberals started saying that you can't trust the Bible. The liberals kept saying that there is transmission errors. The liberals just attacked the scriptures uh, incredibly. And all these godly institutions like Yale and Harvard and Dartmouth, these colleges that were established for training young men for the ministry began to attack the scriptures. God bless them for doing that because there were some other people around us that that's not true. We hold to the scripture. We believe it's inspired by God. We need to take it literally as possible. All of it? All of it literally? Yeah, we take all of it literally as even the part about prophecy. We better look into that here because yeah, because for 1900 years, I think we may have missed something. And because what we call the fundamentalist movement early part of the 1900s, because they were taking a stand for the inerrancy of Scripture. They re-examined everything, and they began to say, you know what? If God promised this to Abraham and his physical descendants, it's probably going to happen. God's probably going to keep his word. Israel's probably going to be regathered back again in the land once again. And they started holding for the very first time in 2,000 years of church history, prophecy conferences. They were not well attended, but a few people came. And a few more people came, and they began to look at the scriptures and the prophecies of the Bible that spoke about the future. And then something amazing happened in 1948. Israel becomes a nation. They were well attended after that. <laughs> and this whole thing got reexamined once again. It wasn't totally departed. Uh, God always had a remnant, and you, can, and you can go back, denied by many church historians. Now some very good books about it, the fact that throughout 2,000 years of church history, there were always believers that held this position that we can trust God's word, we can take it literally and believe what God said would come to pass. Again, so there's important to understand the definition. It's unconditional in terms of its description. It impacts a lot of doctrines, but especially uh, as, as we'll look at prophecy here in the next few weeks and begin that study, this idea of the church and the church and not replacing Israel. Let's go and look at the demonstration of the covenant, which is, I would say, is compelling. Now, again, Abraham, <laughs> 
you know, again, Abraham, you, know, you think about who Abraham is. Aaron. Abraham is just a Abram. He's just a run-of-the-mill pagan like everybody else. He's worshiping all of his pagan deities, living down there in Ur of the Chaldees, uh, worshiping his idols and everything else. He's not, he's not some good godly guy that's seeking the Lord. He's not more special than anyone else. He's just a run-of-the-mill pagan. And then God interrupts his life and then says, Abraham, guess what? I picked you, uh, and I'm going to reveal myself to you. Why, Lord? So that everyone in the world can, can know me, and they can know what a blessing it is to know me. Uh, they can know creation, as Paul says. Uh, they've all got, uh, the, in a sense, uh, God's imprint in terms of their conscience and so forth. But they can't know my redemptive nature. They don't really understand my love and my mercy. And I'm going to reveal that to you. And I'm going to especially reveal myself to you and your descendants in terms of this covenant uh, relationship. Well, how did, how did Abram do? Well, God said, leave your family. Leave her the Chaldeans. Go to the land I'll show you. <laughs> well, he... Uh, did he leave his family? No, it took him with him. He took his dad, <coughs> took his, uh, his nephew and so forth. Uh, did he go to the land the Lord showed him? No, he just actually moved up river a little bit. Remember, Ur the Chaldees was right on the edge of what we, the Persian Gulf. Hey, we know where that is. And we kind of think of it this way in terms of a little memory thing. If Abraham right there, which he could put his finger in the Persian Gulf, he lived so close to it at the tip, and he licked it, oh, salt. Sarah, Abraham, Lot, and Terah. That's, he took all of them and traveled northward up the, through the Tigers and the Euphrates, and he settles in Haran, not where God was leading. So, well, at least he left, you know, at least he left. I'm just all to say this is that this is all God working and a lot of grace, uh, you know, in terms of the life of Abraham. Again, his father, Terah, dies. So now God says, are we ready now? And uh, okay, and then he finally gets to Canaan, to the land that God was showing him. And when he gets there, then God reiterates this whole covenant relation. And he does it in a ceremony. So again, the, the demonstration of the covenant is actually a, a ritual. I'm going to read it to you. It's, um, uh, it's, very, it's a very interesting scene in Genesis 15. I think I've got it for you on the screen if you want to turn there. Genesis 15, 9 to uh, uh, 18, God chooses to condescend to come down to Abram's level so that he can understand how sincere his promise was. Because when they entered into an agreement back then, a covenant relationship, they did some really funny things. Let's see what it says. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. Praise the Lord for something there. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold their appearance, a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, uh, the river Euphrates. A very strange ceremony. We'll talk in a moment about the fact that Abraham understood exactly what was going on, but to make sure we understand. When they entered into a covenant in a relationship in Abram's day, in Abram's culture, typical in the Middle East, that's what they did. They took an animal and they split it in two. Both parties then walked through it, and basically they're saying, we're bound by this, and if we break it, that's what's going to happen to us. It was, it was kind of a bloody mess, and it was... So the, more, the larger the animals, the more the animals, the more serious the covenant. And Abraham had to be impressed with what God asked him to do and then laid out. 
The funny thing for Abraham is that he doesn't get to pass through. God appears in terms of his presence that Abraham can see and understand, a burning torch that is able to pass through. So in a sense, symbolically, God passes through and says, I'm obligated now to keep this covenant in my word. But he does not allow Abraham to pass through because he's not obligated to do anything because it's an unconditional covenant. It's not conditioned upon Abraham. Why is this important? Because again, uh, the other side of the teaching of this for 1900 years or so by most of the church was the fact that Abraham's descendants, the Jews, rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Therefore, ali ali oxen free, all promises are null and void as though they were conditioned upon receiving uh, the Messiah, Jesus, and if they didn't, then all bets were off. That's the teaching. Therefore, we the church are now spiritual Israel all the promises, all the covenants are for us. That's the teaching. But here, even in the ceremony, not just in the idea of a covenant, the idea of the language, but the way it's demonstrated here, it's kind of gross, but God's trying to make his point that you sleep, I pass through, it's all on me whether this is going to happen or not. Now, again, to the second idea, the demonstration was seen in Abraham's understanding of the covenant. Did Abraham get it? Well, Genesis 24, Abraham later would say this, The Lord God of heaven took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Abraham sending off his servant to get a, a wife for his son Isaac, and he says the fact that God swore to me that he gave me this land. To Abraham, <laughs> ceremony seems weird to us. I think Abraham gets it, though. Uh, uh, again, in Genesis 15, 6, it says, And he believed the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness, which, of course, is the verse that Paul quotes often of Abraham and the example of being saved by faith and by faith alone. It's been said that in its context, it means that Abraham grounded himself in the integrity of God. Did Abraham believe that he was saved and was going to have eternal life? Absolutely, because God said so. That was it. That just ended it. Was it conditioned upon him? No. I mean, he put his faith, and he finally got there to Canaan. But when it came right down to it, in terms of all the promises, it was all about what God was going to do and nothing about what Abraham had to do. It was uh, unconditional. Uh, again, so some major doctrines are impacted by this, but a tremendous demonstration that I think is compelling. Let's take a look at some of the details of the covenant that uh, need to be understood because it's about provisions, promises, uh, and blessings. And uh, the details are seen, of course, in the promised land. Uh, the covenant of Genesis, I've given you a lot of references, Deuteronomy 30, Ezekiel 20, some other, other passages. It has to do with what we refer to as Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. Uh, is, is that an issue today? I think they're still struggling over this thing. Maybe we should just send them the CD and get this all straightened out here, huh? It's still kind of a problem for, for some reason. Who, whose land is that uh, over there? Uh, and one of the problems that we have uh, with Israel back in the land is that they have many neighbors around them that are, that are very hostile to them and do not believe that it is their land uh, and that is their land that God gave them. We're, uh, uh, we thank the Lord that Benjamin Netanyahu is, uh, was elected a prime minister because, again, he is a, a believer in the Bible and worships God is a very devout man. He has not received Jesus as his Messiah. We need to pray for that. But he believes that God gave him the land, and that's why he doesn't want to give any more away. Uh, he is coming to this country in just a few days to meet with our, our president, Barack Obama. Uh, they sent last week, he's not the first guy over there since Netanyahu took over just a few months ago, but uh, Panetta went there last week to try to, again, bring about a agenda that we have in our country, at least the current administration, for what we call, what they call a two-state solution, uh, a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. And of course, the Palestinian state is present-day Jordan. Uh, they don't really need another one. They've already got one, been there for quite a while. Uh, 
Uh, this is really all about, in their view, destroying Israel ultimately. And Netanyahu uh, basically said this, and uh, read a very interesting book by his just a few months ago on terrorism. It explained that because of the prior administration, they weren't uh, a lot better, a lot of pressure there uh, to get them to give away land, to give away the Gaza Strip, to give away the, uh, the West Bank, uh, and then even the talk of Samaria, which is the heart of Israel. Uh, and they constantly are pressuring them to give away land. Why is this an issue? Because God gave it to them. And Netanyahu says this, uh, we should have never done that because when we give it away and we no longer police it and patrol it ourselves, we can't control what's going on. We went along with the last administration and in doing so, we pulled out. They pulled out of the Gaza Strip, they pulled out of the West Bank, and the result was those now became hotbeds for terrorists. That's where the training camps were, all the beautiful gardens that they had developed, all the hot houses that they have developed, shipping flowers all over through Europe and so forth. Multi-million dollar industry that they gave to the Palestinians were shortly destroyed and turned into terrorist training uh, grounds and got them closer to be able to launch uh, missiles into Storoth and some of the other uh, areas uh, there uh, in Israel. Again, a very great misunderstanding of this idea of the land of Israel, promised by God, uh, given to, to them. Uh, and uh, it, it's gotten worse. Now we pressured them into having national elections within the Palestinians. Our, our government pressured them to do that, uh, and they did it. And then Hamas wins the election, which is what they were afraid of. So now we have a terrorist organization ruling the people in that area. It's, things are getting worse and, and not better. But it all has to do with not understanding that the promised land, God gave it to Abraham's descendants. Let's go on. Uh, the details are certainly seen in the promised seed and then reiterated to David. Uh, and so the promised seed, singular, is the Messiah. Through Abraham, the Messiah would come, be a blessing to the whole world. Very important. Details are seen in the promised uh, blessing. Again, this idea that uh, uh, I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those uh, that, uh, that curse you. Uh, there's a part of this certainly that is uh, universal. Uh, we all enjoy the blessing of the new covenant that Jesus instituted uh, with, uh, with his blood that he spoke about there in the upper room discourse. And, uh, but uh, all of this comes because God says he will keep his, uh, his word. Let's take a look at, uh, at, at some of the details of the promises. I've actually uh, gone through and analyzed and noted 13 things that are listed in the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, Abraham's name would be great, and certainly uh, we could say that uh, that is true today. A great nation shall come from him, which uh, did happen. Uh, to him and his seed shall all the land of Israel be given forever. That has not yet happened. Again, so there's elements of this that are yet future. Uh, his seed shall be as the dust of the earth, simply talking about the multiplication of the Jewish people. Uh, all the families of the earth shall be blessed because of him. And that's happened because through him, David comes through David, the Messiah comes and all the nations of the earth can be blessed by receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Whoever blesses him would be blessed and whoever curses him would be cursed. And again, if this covenant is still true, today, which we believe it is, then that part of it is still true today. We're going to talk about some of the uh, implications of that in a moment, but just to give you uh, an idea of whether, uh, whether we really believe this or not, if you ever go to uh, Israel today, one of the things that uh, you do along the way is uh, usually you have a, a time at the Jordan River and folks can get baptized and or rebaptized. I mean, Jordan River, why not? I did. Are you kidding me? Yeah, baptize me again. You know, uh, great, great experience. But when Chuck started going, Pastor Chuck, in the early days of taking folks to Israel, uh, they actually had to, uh, you know, you just pull over. It's just a muddy river, you know, and then you, they would uh, put uh, hang towels up in the bus windows, uh, all, everybody off, the gals on and change. They're off, all the guys on change off. And, uh, and then climb down over the rocks, you know, through the bushes and uh, try to find some place in the mud where you could kind of get your footing and, uh, and they would do the baptism. Chuck finally, you know, again, I realized, that, you know, that's just not the best, uh, best scenario there. Uh, and after all, God says, I'll bless those that bless you. So Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa then donated 
a large sum of money to the Ministry of Tourism of Israel for the establishment and building a baptism site. And when you go there today, there's like five or six little amphitheaters, this beautiful gift shop changing area and so forth. And they've got like cement that goes down into the water. Don't even have to get your feet muddy anymore. There's even a little handrail if you're afraid you're going to uh, uh, slip. And it's, it's a wonderful experience because... Um, You'll have a, you know, a place, uh, you know, reserved, but you're walking by and hear some folks from Italy that are, that are singing worship songs in, in, in Italian. And, oh, here's a bunch of uh, guys uh, uh, from Spain or somewhere, and they're singing worship songs in Spanish. And then you go, you just have all of these languages and all these Christians, you know, sitting in these little amphitheaters worshiping the Lord. Uh, and it's a, it's a great experience to see the whole body of Christ. But it's there, and that side is there because... I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to, to believe it. Again, Abraham would be the father of many nations, which he is not only through Isaac, but through Ishmael as well. Kings would proceed for him. Number eight, which uh, uh, we see in the Old Testament, this covenant would be an everlasting covenant. Again, eternal. Uh, and the land of Canaan would be an everlasting possession. Not quite, again, because it goes from uh, from the Mediterranean all the way to the Euphrates. Oh, that's a couple other countries in, in there that is all really supposed to be part of Israel, so that's still yet future. Um, again, God would be his God and to his seed. Uh, Twelve, his seed would possess the gates of his enemy. And uh, we, we see that some in the Old Testament. Uh, we've seen that in several recent wars since 1948 where God miraculously intervenes on behalf of the nation of Israel and militarily protects them. And there's some wonderful stories that come out of that war. We may be living in a day to see another one in what we refer to as the Magog invasion because we know that at some point in time, a confederation of Arab states or Muslim states really uh, with uh, some forces of Russia uh, will invade Israel and God will intervene on their behalf and destroy two-thirds of, uh, of their, uh, their military. Uh, they will not possess the, the, the gate. They will possess the gates of, of their enemies. So uh, that's... that's uh, they're showing that in a preview on TV a lot these days, you know, to let us know that that's, that's coming up soon. It's nice of them to give us these biblical highlights of what is about ready to be fulfilled. And have you seen those highlights? Talking about that guy, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, that God has allowed to, to rise to power. Uh, one of the reasons they, they allowed the, God allowed him to rise to power is so the people of Iran could see what uh, Islam in Shari form looks like. Because what happened is prior to that, in 1979, there were two to 3,000 Christians in Iran. Today, there's two to three million. They're, they're real open to the gospel, li living under that, uh, that regime. Uh, so very interesting to watch all this unfold uh, before us. And again, in his seed shall all the nations of the earth, earth be blessed. So really 13 aspects uh, of the covenant. But again, uh, it's unconditional uh, doctrines that it impacts, the demonstration, the ritual, very compelling. Uh, the demands of the covenant impact our world today, and some of these I've already mentioned, but uh, uh, the demands of the uh, covenant are for all people because, again, God reveals himself to Abraham for the purpose uh, that uh, he would then reveal his word, uh, and, and then he would reveal the Messiah, uh, and all the nations of the earth would come to uh, to know this Jewish Messiah. Think of Jesus there in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 4, with uh, a Gentile, a Samaritan woman. He's sharing with her. And he says in John 4, 22, you worship what you do not know. Uh, we know what we worship, for salvation is of, of the Jews. And again, this is pretty obvious, studying the scripture, but it has been, uh, by and large, ignored by most of the church for a number of years which has made it very difficult now in our day often to wish to uh, witness to Jews because they have been so discriminated, harassed, and persecution, persecuted in the name of Christ for the, for the last uh, 1,900 years. Thank God some of that's changing. Guess what? It's going to get worse, uh, as, uh, especially once the true church is removed from planet Earth. But again, salvation, uh, as Paul said, to the Jew first and, and then to the Gentile. Secondly, the, the demands of the covenant are seen uh, in history. 
Uh, they're seen in terms of the covenant people. They're seen also in terms of, uh, of history. And uh, there's a few fellows in history that could testify to this idea that I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. Uh, one would be a, a guy named Napoleon. Napoleon was just going about his business, conquering the world, and he was doing pretty good at it. Uh, and as long as he held a favorable disposition to J the Jews that were living in Israel. He didn't do so well in one of his battles. He was a little frustrated as he made his way back up from south to north, went through uh, Israel, decided to take it out on them, and severely persecuted the Jewish people, uh, destroying much of their property, killing many, and so forth. And the next winter, he found himself at a little place called Waterloo, where he found it's not a good idea to, re to uh, have an, uh, a war in the middle of winter against the Russians. And uh, that was basically his end. Napoleon could testify that it's true. I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. We could go on and on. It was once said that the British Empire, that the sun never set on the British Empire because for a long time they were favorably disposed to the Jewish people. And in fact, they were struggling in World War I and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, because basically it was a stalemate fighting with, uh, with, the, with the Germans. And a Jewish man named Wiseman, who was a very good chemist, came up with a way of developing a system whereby they could uh, kind of master the, the explosives that they had at their uh, disposal at that time. It was the turning point in the war. Uh, they were able to defeat the Germans finally. And so uh, the prime minister, Balford, says to Wiseman, what is the one thing we can do in our thinks, basically for saving our country the Western world and helping in this terrible war. The one thing you can do, Mr. Prime Minister, give us our homeland once again, which the British had control of of that time. All of Palestine. Again, Palestine is Jordan, but it also include what we call modern day Israel. And so he made the Balfour Declaration and said, we'll do that. We're going to give it to you. It's going to be your homeland and so forth. We'll Pass it through the United Nations. It's ours to give. We give it to you. Thank you for helping us defeat the Germans in World War I. And then he got a little pressure from Arab states saying, you do that, we're going to cut off your oil supply. We're glad that's not an issue anymore, you know, that we kind of got this hashed out, you know, back there in the early 1900s. Uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, Balfour said, sorry, I lied. <laughs> uh, I lied. We're not going to give it to you. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're going to turn your boats away. We're going to turn your people away when they're running away from the Holocaust and we could save their lives. We're not going to help you at all. And even after the Holocaust, when you try to return, we're going to fight with the Turks against you to prevent you from taking uh, back what we said we would give you freely, said the British. And you can't, and the British is not as great as it used to be. They're, they're a shadow. Uh, of what they were in terms of a, a world power, their economy, uh, the territory that they had control of. It's still true today. If you study history, I'll bless those that bless you, I'll curse those that curse you. The third thing, and I won't uh, go too much into it, but the demands of the covenant are being felt in the United States. And uh, we'll see that in the days of head. Uh, we're, ar we're already feeling it, we're already seeing it. Again, it was our, our government uh, our, our previous administration that was pressuring Israel to give away land, uh, to uh, allow uh, Hamas to take over and so forth, and, uh, and we have felt the effects. A very good book came out a few years ago by um, uh, Bill Koenig called it The Eye of the Storm. He's a Washington uh, correspondent, been there for a number of years, covers most of the White House stuff. He's a believer, and he began to correlate every time we pressured Israel to give away their land and within 24 or 48 hours, some catastrophic uh, event that would take place in our own country. It's, it's pretty interesting reading. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant is still true today. In Matthew 25, Jesus there at the end of all of that discourse says, when he comes back to the earth one day, he's going to judge the nations. And he judges the nations based on what their leadership does. Not the people. A nation gets judged biblically throughout the Bible what the leadership decides on behalf of that country. And nations are going to get judged, according to Jesus, based on whether they are anti-Semitic or pro-Semitic, whether they're against Israel or for Israel. That's it. That's what they're going to get judged for. Uh, we could be in for some rocky days uh, ahead uh, in, in regards to 
the direction we're moving in regards to, uh, to Israel. Uh, the seventh thing, and uh, I'll make this quickly, is the destiny of Israel is based on the covenant. Again, there's a destiny of this covenant to be fulfilled in terms of uh, you know, the things that we've been talking about. Does the Abrahamic covenant promise Israel a permanent existence as a nation? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, they, they still struggle with their enemies. Does the Abrahamic covenant promise Israel a permanent possession of uh, the promised land? And yes, it does. And these things are going to come to, to place. Uh, and it's to them as a nation. It's to them, we would say, secondly, as they a particular people, the physical descendants, because again, this gets spiritualized into the church and other people groups and so forth. Let me just read from John Wolverd. He says, nothing should be plainer than that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob understood the term seed as referring to their physical lineage. The term Israel is a title given to Jacob, meaning prince of God. It has commonly been used to designate the physical descendants of Jacob. So Again, we're not, we're not talking about somehow interpreting this in a mystical way or as an allegorical way. It is their physical descendants. And God has brought them back to the land, and God will uh, be faithful to his word. And certainly there's a destiny in the covenant that applies to us because, uh, again, we're able to receive relationship with uh, God through Jesus Christ because of the Abrahamic uh, covenant. And... Um, let me uh, just skip over some of my other notes and just make reference to uh, one thing just in closing because I'm kind of out of time. The, um, Paul, when he's, uh, when he's laying out uh, uh, how glorious our salvation is, you know, it begins in Romans and early on establishes that the religious person, you know, needs to be forgiven of their sins. Uh, you know, the Jews, the ones that have the law and so forth. The non-religious person, begin, because of uh, creation, because of our conscience, they've had a clear witness of God. Uh, they need to be forgiven of their sins as well. All have sinned to come sure of the glory of God. By the time he gets to chapter 6, he's laying out a position that, uh, that we need to be saved by grace. You know, again, uh, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And then he begins to, uh, to lay that out for us to help us understand. By the time he gets to chapter 8, then, he's saying, he begins by saying, because everything he said so far, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because we're saved by grace and by grace alone. By the time he gets to the end of chapter 8, he's getting kind of worked up now. And he's saying, you know what? There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Not height, not depth, not... He just kind of goes off. Nothing can separate us. We have a tendency to think there's some things that can separate us sometimes. But Paul says there's nothing that can separate us from the love that's of God that's in Christ Jesus. He says, you want proof? I'll give you proof. And then chapter 9, he says, look at Israel. That's my illustration. Look at everything that's happened in the past to them. He says, chapter 10, look, look where they're at right now and how stubborn they can be and so forth. And I, I'm trying to win them to Christ. And then he gets to chapter 11. Have they stumbled so far yet to not recover? He says, oh, certainly not, because it's going to be glorious for them in the future. Uh, he's so excited because of, of God's grace and the glory of the gospel. He says, the chief illustration is Israel. He says, because God's going to keep his word. You can believe his promises. And if you believe that God's given up on Israel, you're in real trouble in regards to your own salvation. If you think their relationship with God and those covenant promises are predicated upon their ability to keep something or do something, then we're all in trouble in regards to our salvation. But that's not the case. That's why Paul uses them as an illustration. He gets so excited about the whole thing, he just stops. He just stops and starts worshiping the Lord. And that's when he says... <clears throat> Oh, the depths and the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his past beyond uh, finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who's given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. He's getting all excited when he thinks about Israel, how God's going to be faithful to them because of the Abrahamic covenant. What does he say to us then? He says, therefore... Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual act of worship. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world that denies the Abrahamic covenant. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed from it by the renewing of your mind, that you might test and approve what his will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. 
We're going to miss God's will, apparently, if we don't understand our faith in so much resurrection and what's going to happen in God's prophetic plan is predicated upon God dealing with the nation of Israel. Paul says he's going to be faithful. <laughs> and look at those guys and look what they've done. Uh, and, and look where they're at now, but it's a glorious future. Therefore, it's a glorious future for us as well. And our response should be worship the Lord. Well, God is good. We can believe his promises and he's faithful to us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your, uh, your faithfulness. I just feel like we've just tip of the iceberg in terms of looking at this uh, issue of, uh, of your covenant with Abraham, uh, def- trying to define it, trying to look at it, make sure that we understand very clearly that it's eternal, that it's unconditional. And therefore, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they died without seeing it fulfilled. So the only way that your word can be true is if you raise them from the dead, along with all those other faithful believers that died waiting to see the Messiah come. And those now that have died waiting to see the Messiah come and establish his kingdom here on, uh, on earth. Lord, so we thank you for the faithfulness uh, uh, of your word. And because of that, now when we study prophecy, uh, Lord, we know that you're speaking the truth about things that are going to happen in the future. And certainly we, we've, seen, we've seen that in the past, all the prophecy that is fulfilled. And, and so now as we study what's around the corner, what's going to happen in the next uh, several days, in the next few years, what's, what's going to be happening to planet Earth? Well, we don't have to wonder, Lord. You, you really explained it all to us very, very clearly. So I pray that this would act as a, as a wonderful foundation, Lord, for our trust in you and your promises and our continued study in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.